We have a special song. We'd like to dedicate this song tonight with a dance by Kimberly for Zion's sake, one of Ben Green's favorite. I know Ben. And um, this is for you, Ben, so enjoy it.
Thank you, Kimberly Avella. That was beautifully executed. How many of you are enjoying the Seder so far? Good. And how many of you think Clara McQueen did an excellent job at making that presentation? Amen. That's very good. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. We're going to uh, take up a love offering for Claren. Claren comes all the way here as a minister of the gospel. Um, be it made known that Claren does not work at, at, at um, an airlines or a, uh, a shopping center or sales or anything of that nature. He's a minister of the gospel. And the word of the Lord says that a workman is worthy of his wages. And let those who labor among you be worthy of double honor. So I'll just this evening, we want to show our appreciation for Claren driving all the way up here. And somebody told me that gas was like $4 a gallon. So, and I think the IRS is knocking at the door as well on the 15th or 17th of this month. So you all know what that's all about. But we want to bless Claren. Whenever a minister comes to impart to you, to bless you with anything, it has a value that goes way beyond dollars and cents. But we want to show our appreciation when we honor fellow ministers in the gospel. So consider that. And if you're going to make out a check this evening, please make it out to Cornerstone Church. And in the little memo section, just put Claren in the little memo section. So let's pray over this offering. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for Claren and Nancy coming, Lord, out of their schedule to make room to come to Cornerstone Church to bless and to impart and to lift up and to encourage and to bring faith to the members of this congregation. And I thank you, Lord, for our long-standing relationship one with another. Our covenant together, Lord, exceeds that of many, many on this earth. And we're just thankful, Lord, that uh, Claren is connected to us in so many different ways. And tonight, Lord, we give thanks for you for sending him here. And we ask you, Lord, that in our generosity, Lord, that you would return a blessing unto this house in multiple folds. We honor you and bless you, Lord, tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Derek's going to go to the right, and Chris is going to go to the left. And while they are doing that, I'm going to ask for every single person in this room who's of the age of 13 years old and younger to come and sit down right here in the middle of the stage area, 13 and under. And I want to see how many are going to be 13 and under. OK, I'm going to raise it to 14. 14 and under, OK. Anybody else? Yeah, come, come, come and bring them in. 27 years old and younger. If you are 27. No, don't come up here if you're 27. No, 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 no. How old are you, Honor? Are you kidding? All right. Sit down. I think Mia is going to get <clears throat> some of the other kids that are in the other room. How did you guys like the Passover Seder so far? Do you guys like it? Yeah. Has anybody learned anything about the Lord? What did you learn about the Lord? Um, I forgot. You forgot. OK. There'll be prayer for memory at the end of the service today. We'll, do you learn something today about the Lord? Or you just look excited? He, oh, he's excited about finding the after coming. Did you find something out about the Lord? What? I got to do the four questions. Yes, you did. That was very good. OK. I'll tell you, it's good just to have the kids here in this atmosphere and this environment. Whether they remember this or not, in years to come, they'll look back on it, and they'll have all those great memories. All right, young ladies and young gentlemen, in my hand, I possess this. This is almost enough to buy a Whopper with Coke and a fry. It used to be, and I was thinking about this the other day. I was telling my kids, hold on, hold on. 
When I was in high school, we went to lunch. We went to Burger King on Hallandale Beach Boulevard down there. And two Whoppers and a Coke for 90 cents. Two Whoppers, that's where I got my be belly from, and a Coke for 90 cents. So things have changed. Come on in, gentlemen. Have a seat. Now, look up here, guys, for one minute. You remember that at the beginning of the service, I reached into this matzah tosh, and I took out a piece of matzah from the middle chamber, and I broke the matzah and blessed it. We put the other part of the matzah back in, and we hid the other part. This is called a zafun, that which is hidden. This is the time when you all, as young people, go out and you see if you can find the afikomen, find the hidden matzah. Now, those of, there's only going to be one person, obviously, that finds it. But the person that finds it, you're going to be symbolic of all of us. But you're going to get $5 indicating the number five is grace. So when you find the Lord, you get grace. You get a free gift. And the free gift is that you get to go to heaven when you find the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a great deal? If you find the Lord, you get to go to heaven for free. So tonight, in one minute, I'm going to ask you to go through the sanctuary area, not in the hallway. Listen, not in the hallway, and not up there where the instruments are on the stage, okay? Don't go on the stage because it's not there. You see where Uncle Steve is back there? It's not back there either. So don't go back where there's any electronics. But there's somewhere in this room hidden in a, a little napkin is the afikomen. So I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask you to stand up. No running is allowed. Anybody runs is automatically disqualified. You walk to the Lord. Okay? Go. Walk, do not run. Walk, do not run. Colder, 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 colder. Colder, colder, hotter, hotter. Go! Seek and you shall find. I'll give you another hint. It's not under the table. It's not under the table. Remember, guys, you're looking for a white napkin with a piece of matzah in it. A white napkin with a piece of matzah in it. So it's going to be white. Ah, come on back. Somebody found the matzah. <laughs> All right. All right. I think we're going to have a little lesson about Christianity in a few minutes that you guys will really enjoy. All right, you guys, go on back to your seats. You guys right here, go back to your parents. And parents, you got a lot of work to do.
Dom, go. Go. All right, Honor Hernandez is the eventual winner here. So, Honor, I'll trade you. Afi Komen, and there's your grace. God bless you. Let's give him a big hand and bless him. Now we've come to the cup of redemption, the cup that is after supper. If you remember the New Testament, it says after supper, he took the cup. But before we drink that cup, I just want to talk to you about where everyone's sitting. So disciples, if you'll go back to sitting in the first century with your left elbow leaning out. Okay, now, if you remember the New Testament, you remember that as they come into this room, Peter and John have set up the room ahead of time, right? They didn't know where it was. Jesus just said, go to the pool of Siloam, look for a man carrying a water pot. They follow him to the building where the room is going to be. They find the room, and then they set it up. Then all the disciples come in. Now, they've already seated themselves now, but if you remember the New Testament, they were arguing about who was the greatest. Now, you probably read that and thought, this, after three years of training, they're still arguing about who's the greatest? What, what's up with this? But what you didn't know, uh, and hopefully what you remember from last year, if you came last year, is that this table has an order of importance. So it goes from this right side, the greatest, down to the least. Every table at every feast would have had this ceremonial tradition. So this is what Jesus is saying when he tells his parable. When you go to a feast, don't take these seats on the right side. Go ahead, take seats on the left side. And then maybe the master of the feast who sits at the top will come and say, hey, friend, you're down too low. Come and take a seat up higher. So we know at the Last Supper that there is no servant. Why do we know that? Because their feet are dirty. They didn't get their feet washed. If there had been a servant, he would have been, he or she would have been right at the door where they came in, washing their feet, washing their hands, preparing them to come to the table. There also is no other host in the Last Supper why? Because Jesus is the master of the ceremony. He is the one that is leading everyone through the Passover. He begins by saying, I welcome you. I belong to eat this Passover together with you. So we know that he's sitting in the host seat. And where would you think the host seat would be? I'll give you a clue. It's not in the center where Da Vinci put it. <laughs> Okay, you might think that if it goes from the greatest to the least, that the host would be sitting where honor is sitting. But that's not the seat of the host. It's the second seat in. Why is that? We have Jesus playing Jesus tonight. <laughs> Who else? Uh, in Jesus' day, it's very important to give honor. So if I sit in the second seat in as the host, then I have a right-hand man seat and a left-hand man's seat, both places of honor. The left-hand man is actually the seat of the guest of honor. And this right-hand man's seat is where Yeshua is sitting now in the heavenlies at the right hand of the Father, awaiting us getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I kind of think that the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be a table somewhat like this. Okay, so if Jesus is sitting in this second seat, you know from the New Testament who is sitting where honor is sitting. Who is that? John. Because, John, I'm just going to have you recline more. Okay, and if you'll lean on your left elbow, Jesus. Okay, so if they're sitting like this, if John wants to ask Jesus a question, what does he do? he winds up leaning on his chest, right? So you probably looked at those paintings, I always did as a kid, and thought, 
what is up with this thing? Guy sitting in a Western tiles chair and leaning on Jesus' chest. It looks like he's falling asleep at the meal. It's kind of like a Sunday morning thing. But you can see if they're lying down, that's what's going to happen. Now, you know John is sitting in this first seat. Jesus is in the second one. You also know who is sitting in this seat from the New Testament. Who is it? It's Judas. Why do we know that? Because Jesus says, I'm dipping into the same bowl. It's the one to whom I offer the sop. We get two clues. One of the Gospels says, it's the one who's dipping into the bowl with me. They would have had, we have nice Western-style individual plates. They would have had big communal bowls. And then another Gospel says, I'm offering him the sop. Now, I told you that's something that only happens with the guest of honor. That's amazing when you think about it. That right up to the time that he walks out the door, Jesus is honoring Judas. Now, there is a possibility of a fourth person that we know where he's sitting, and that fourth person is Peter. And I'd like to suggest that he's sitting at this least seat. And I have three evidences for that. To begin with, when they come in the room, who set up the meal? Peter and John did. Who is the man that you would think would be sitting for sure up at the head part of the table? Peter, right? He's at the head of everything. On this rock, I'll build my church. But when John takes the right-hand man seat, that's okay. John did a lot of work too. But Jesus is the host. Only the host can give the guest of honor seat. So Jesus gave personally the guest of honor seat to Judas. Now, think of who you are as Peter. You're the man who sometimes engages his mouth before he engages his mind. You know, right after in Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter gets the question right, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, flesh and blood hasn't revealed that to you. You got that direct from heaven. Right after that, Jesus says, now the Son of Man is about to be crucified. He's going to go to Jerusalem and die. And you as Peter feel free to say, are you kidding? You can't do that. You're the Messiah. That doesn't happen to the Messiah. You know, you're telling the Son of God how to be the Son of God. So, once these people have taken the highest seats, you being Peter, a little bit hot-headed, are you going to sit underneath Judas directly where Alex is sitting? No, you're not. You know who Judas is. You know he's been nabbing from the purse. So, perhaps you do what Jesus said to do. You go down to the lowest seat, and you wait for the host to come and move you up. Now, if our conjecture is right, Jesus, as the host, didn't come and move him up. Now, this brings me to the second evidence of Peter sitting here, and that is, as we've said, all of these people are facing this way. This side is facing back to the back. Do you see it's really hard for somebody in Phil's position Unless John just happens to be looking at him, it's hard to get John's attention. The easiest place to get John's attention is right here at the last seat, which Peter wants to do, if you remember from the New Testament. When Jesus announces, someone is going to betray me, Peter wants to know who it is, but the New Testament tells us he can't ask Jesus himself, and he can't even ask John but he signs to John. So it's pretty easy from this position. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Even if John is a little bit slow, look toward him, John. <laughs> it's not raining grapes. <laughs> so then he can sign to John, ask Jesus who it is. We need to know who it is. Okay. Now, we have one last evidence, and that comes because there's no servant. 
so nobody's feet have been washed. Now, at this table, if there's no servant in the room, who's the person who should be washing feet? The lowest seat. But if our conjecture's right, who's least likely to be in the mood to wash anybody's feet? The lowest seat. He's still get there with his arms crossed waiting for the host to move me up. How come you're not moving me up? And Jesus begins to talk to the disciples with this in mind. Let's just listen to what he says. You'll find this in Luke's gospel. Yeshua says, the king of the Gentiles like to lord it over other people. And those who have authority over other people are called their benefactors. But not so with you. But let him who's the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as the servant. He goes on, for who is greater, the one who reclines at table or the one who serves? But I'm among you as one who serves. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may one day eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you're going to sit on thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's saying to Peter, I'm just asking you to be a servant now. There's better things coming. He's saying that to each one of us tonight, by the way. Nothing happens in Luke's gospel. And finally, Yeshua addresses Peter directly in Luke's gospel and says, Shimon, Simon, Look out, the accuser has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I'm praying for you, and I've prayed for you already, that your faith may not fail, and you, when you've turned back again, will strengthen your brothers. Peter replies, like Peter, as a hero, Lord, I'm ready right now to go with you both to prison and to death. And it's right in this tense moment that Jesus says, Peter, I'm telling you, before the cock even crows, you'll have denied me three times before the night's over. But still, nothing happens. So Jesus gets up, as any good rabbi would do. He takes off his cloak, and he begins going around the table washing the feet himself. He would have started at the head of the table with John, and then he would have gone around to the end. So as we watch Jesus doing this now, this is what he does for each one of us. When we're faithful, when we're not faithful, when we get it right, and he can say, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but the Holy Spirit himself has revealed what you've gotten. And when we get it absolutely wrong, he's still serving us day after day, week after week. Now, this is where my third evidence comes in. Jesus would have gone around the table and the Gospels say, and when he got to Peter, implying that he gets to Peter at the end. Now, this also explains why Peter responds the way he does. As Jesus has gone around the table, none of the other disciples have said anything. They've just allowed them, their feet to be washed. But when Jesus gets to Peter, Peter's saying, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. I realize I should have been the one to do it. And Jesus says, but Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have a part in who I am. I'm calling you to be a servant. I want you to be just like me. And Peter, of course, being Peter, says, well, all right, then. Wash my head and my hands both. I'll take a shower. <laughs> And Jesus says, no, Peter, that's not what I'm asking you to do. 
You already are clean inside. I know your heart. I'm just calling you to be a part of me. I want you to allow me to wash your feet. This is the lesson of this Last Supper. Yes, the Lord started an entire new covenant. Yes, it's true. We've all experienced it. He's written His law on our heart. We don't even have to say, you need to know the Lord, because we know the Lord in our heart. We hear His voice speaking to our heart day after day, just like Isaiah prophesied. This is the way, walk in it, when we turn to the right or to the left. But the Lord says there's more than that. It's not just that you're full of my law, you're full of my word, you're full of my promise, but you're full of my promise for a reason, to be a servant. You're full of my word for a reason, to serve other people. What's the definition of covenant? All these eight covenants, what is a covenant? It's relationship. When Jesus is asked, what's the center of the law, what does he say? Love your father and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love folks. It's all covenant. Have a great relationship with God, but then that causes you to have a great relationship with the people I place around you, no matter who they are. So we're ready for the third cup. If you'll fill your cup. And the promise of this third cup, again from Exodus 6, is I will redeem you with outstretched arm and a mighty hand. Now, I'd just like to say, each of you as disciples coming to Passover dinners year after year, you would have heard this promise over and over again. And in your mind, you would have seen I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm, just like Moses stretched his arm out over the Red Sea. You're probably thinking just what they were saying in the book of Acts. God is going to come. He's going to get those rotten Romans out of the Antonia fortress. He's going to put righteous government where it should be, and we're going to be saved. That's the outstretched arm. They didn't realize until just a few days later that Jesus was fulfilling that covenant, but he was redeeming them with an outstretched arm. And I'd like to suggest to you, as we take this cup of redemption, we all are the same. So often we think we have what God is planning to do all figured out because we read it in the Word. Here's the promise right here, Lord. This is what you have to do. And he says, yes, I've made the promise, and yes, I will fulfill the promise, but it might not come in the way that we expect, and yet it will come. So as we drink this cup, if you'll pray after me, Baruch atah Adonai, Melech HaOlam, Borei Pri HaGafen. Lord, we thank you for this cup of redemption. We thank you for your blood poured out. And we thank you that right now in the 21st century, no less than that first Passover, you still are stretching out your hand to redeem us. Your arm is not short. Your hand's not weak. And we bless your name, Father, as you continue to fulfill your plan. And God's people say, amen. You can partake. Now we're ready for the fourth cup of the Passover meal, the cup of thanksgiving. This promise is, I will take you to myself as my own people. And there's an argument from Scripture that they didn't drink this cup. 
If you remember, Jesus said, I won't drink this cup again until I drink it new with you in the kingdom. And in the New Testament, if you remember, it says they sang a hymn and they went out. It should say they drank the last cup and they sang a hymn and they went out. So it could be that the Lord is still waiting to drink this cup of praise as he takes us to himself as his own people at the heavenly banquet for the wedding supper of the Lamb. I don't know. We'll find out then when we arrive. But before we drink this fourth cup, I just want to drink, uh, read to you Psalm 116. And the reason I'm doing this is because we know that this is one of the psalms that they would have sung at the end when they sang the hymn and went out. They sang Psalm 115 through 118. We already sang 118. Hodula Adonai Kitov Kileolam Chasto. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness, his fatherly goodness, his unmerited mercy and favor are for all people for all time. But I'd like you to close your eyes and just listen to Psalm 116. Yeshua would have sung this just before they left this room. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he's inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I shall call upon him as long as I live. The cords of death have encompassed me, and the terrors of hell itself have come against me. I found distress and sorrow. But then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, but he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you've rescued my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all men are liars. But what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will lift up the cup of salvation. In Hebrew, who's singing, I will lift up the cup of Yeshua. I will call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. May it be in the presence of all his people. For precious in the sight of my God is the death of his godly ones. O Lord, surely I'm your servant. I am your servant and the son of your handmaid. You've loosed my bonds. To you I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. May it be in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. So as they left this room, there was a part of Jesus that was about to say, if this cup can pass from me, then please let it pass from me. But I'd like to suggest to you that there was a bigger part of Jesus that said, I'm going to lift up the cup of salvation. I'm going to pay my vows to the Lord. May it be in the presence of all his people. So we've come to the end of the Passover, and we're just about to celebrate with more praise. But as we do, I just want to pray if you'll bow your heads with me. And Lord, we thank you for your hand. We thank you, Lord, that according to this Psalm 116, that's exactly what you did. You lifted up the cup of salvation. And as your soul returned to its rest, you could say, I've paid my vows. I've done what I was called to do. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You've redeemed us with your outstretched arms. You've given us the bread of life so that we can live life more abundantly forever. What can we give you for all your benefits that you've given us? We will lift up the cup of your salvation and call on your name. 
We offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise, and we bless your name forever and ever. Baruch haba Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed. Blessed be your name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Let your kingdom come and your will be done, Lord, just as it is in heaven. Would you pray that with me? Let your kingdom come and your will be done just as it is in heaven. Pray it out loud with me. Let your kingdom come and your will be done just as it is in heaven. You know, in many seders, they end by saying, Hashanah haba'ai Yerushalayim. But I'd just like to say tonight, we don't have to go to Jerusalem because the Passover is within us. We've been given that new covenant with the law written on our heart, made ready to go out and praise. And God's people say, Amen. Now, we're just about ready to praise. Pastor Dom, do you have anything else to say? Wasn't that wonderful? Amen. We really, we really hope this year that would bring you closer into what happened that night. And um, so you'd have a greater sensibility of the greatness of what, the, what Jesus really taught in the Passover Seder. And I hope you got that message very strongly. I would also suggest to you that there, Claren has a table on the outside in the foyer area of all of, of his um, current CDs and some of the things that he's done, so stop by that as well. And I want to also let you know that Claren will be here um, this Sunday leading worship here at our congregation, and then next Sunday as well. So you have two Sundays more of uh, Claren and Nancy, so you can um, get some impartation there as well. So if you have to leave after um, a certain period of time, feel free at this point on. We're going to worship the Lord and spend some time worshiping Him. And uh, if, But if you have uh, little children that have to go on, that's fine. We'll see you on Sunday morning. Okay, Claren? Can we bring up the house slaves? So we're going to invite you to praise the Lord. This is another one of the psalms that they would have sung at the end, Psalm 117. It says, lift up the Lord, all you nations. Praise the Lord, all you people. He is mighty in mercy on us. Adonai is faithful forever. But the chorus is really hard. I'm not sure you're going to get it. So repeat it after me. Hallelujah. 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 Okay, you get the picture. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. like they know what they're doing. All they're doing is following Kimberly. So if you want to dance, go ahead and dance. <laughs>
Okay, every one of you have got to know Havana Gila. And I'm giving this to you early so you can dance before you go home if you have to go home. So get your courage up. Come on and dance.
The Spirit and the Bride say come. This is Revelation 22, 17. Let the one who hears cry out. Cry out now, come. If you're thirsty, come now. If your heart desires, come and take the free gift of living water.
those prophecies say, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. I will save you for my own people. And then the Lord says in, Ezekiel, in Exodus 6 and 8, and I will bring you back into the land that I promised to you. This is Jeremiah 33, verses 10 and 11. A song will be heard in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bride and the voice of the bridegroom. A song will be heard in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. offer up the Lord a final praise song. He says there will be a day when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord fills the earth. But he also says right now the glory of the Lord is filling the earth. So before we leave tonight, would you just stand one more time? Unless it's too tiring, if you... Uh, ate too much dinner and you can't get up, I will understand. You can just sing. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your hand over us. And Lord, as we end this night, this last night in the season of Passover, we thank you for your presence here. Thank you that you continue to serve us. 
and serve us. And yet again, you serve us. And we say, Yeshua, 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 you are Lord, Yeshua.
kind of think that Jesus would have done one last thing that the New Testament doesn't record because it's the blessing that the Lord had used over his people for 2,000 years. God spoke to Moses and said, this is the way you should bless my people. And if you will just lift up your hands to receive the blessing, I'm going to pray this over you, and then I'm going to sing it over you. But the Holy Spirit is going to do it. It doesn't have to do with who's singing or what it sounds like. It has to do with that faithful God that we serve. And he says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious. Just like Pastor Don was saying, you found Jesus, so you found grace. The Lord caused his face to shine over you and fill you full with the peace, his peace that passes understanding. Yair Adonai Panavelecha Vechonecha Veisa Yeshua HaMashiach Le'olam Ba'ed And Ben, we sing it over you that the peace of the Lord would fill you full. And right now we join our faith together. And Ben, we're saying... May the Lord be gracious to you. Lord, we call upon your gift from your Holy Spirit of faith, of the working of miracles, and of healing. And as we stretch out our hands, we receive that healing, and we receive it especially for our brother. strength of the Lord. And God's people say, Amen.